Good evening, the known universe. Hello, how are we? I'm Gareth Jones. Welcome to Gareth Jones Live. Joining me on the sofa just over there, Violet Berlin. Give us a shout, V. Sounds like an entire audience. It's a bit dark. Don't you think it's a bit dark in here tonight? I'm not sure. Maybe it's my white shirt that's making it a bit dark. It's That's weird, isn't it? That's weird. How are we, humans? Let's have a look at the roll call. Who's in the house tonight? We have Violet Berlin, known as VB, on the chat. We have James Ramsden sitting in the front rows. Good evening, Mr. Ramsden. Anne Ashmore, who's also in the front row. Pole position in the royal box tonight. Not that we recognise royalty here at Gareth Jones. Live, I think that's the democratically elected box. Ooh, a Huge bunch of people. Uh, Robert Jennings. Hello, Robert. Nice to have you with us. Hyper Kerry. Kerry. A fellow Hollywellian. Uh, Kerry, who um, used to cut hair for Len the Barber um, in Hollywell. Len the Barber was the barber in Hollywell where I had my hair cut between the ages of zero, probably... 14 before my sister Mel started cutting my hair he had one of those boards that he put on the chair that I could sit on and I remember he used to laugh because I used to flick he used to put the you know the uh, the sheet over me the the cloth what do you call it the the shroud shroud something like that the where and I would flick the hair off and it, anyway Hollywell stuff childish stuff lovely to have Kerry with you how are your dogs Kerry I see um, posts of you taking your dogs down the gorgeous Greenfield Valley and if you've ever been to North Wales and to my ho our hometown me and Kerry go to um, Hollywell go to the Greenfield Valley to the Mill Ponds it's really lovely post um, industrial North Wales there used to be a, a, a paper mill there uh, a wool mill I think but mainly paper mills and uh, oh I love it there I love it there right who else have we got in the house um, bike shed Digital media, my great friend John Coombs. Good evening, John. John, how is the lighting design tonight? I am slightly baffled as to why it's so dark. I've got the usual full brightness light on, but it's it's really struggling. I really think it's my white shirt. I really do. Um, Rachel Knoll. Hello, Rachel in the Netherlands. Hello, everybody who's not in the UK. Um, Kapla <laughs> says Mark Sepek. Kapla. Uh, so anyone who's watch, watching on Kronos, which is the Vulcan home, I haven't got a list, but it's Kronos, not Kronos. Kronos, I believe it's pronounced. So anyone who speaks Vulcan, like Mark Sepek, and we're very excited. We got some very exciting Star Trek news earlier tonight, which I may mention again a little bit later on. Very exciting Star Trek news. Amazingly good news. Um. Bar Humbug. Who's that? Who's Bar Humbug? Someone who doesn't enjoy Christmas. Evening, Gareth. Good evening. Brian Thomas in Ohio. Everybody, wave across the pond to Ohio. Wonderful to have American people with us. Brian, so pleased that you're with us once again. Uh, Rocking Kitten, another person in the Netherlands. I love the Dutch people, as you know. Um, who Rocking Kitten, Tintin, describes this as the highlight of the week. I am flattered. Thank you, Val. That is amazing that you say that. You must have had a very dull week. That's all I can think of. James Ramsden. Good evening, James Ramsden. Uh, Chris Bow. Chris Bow. Hello, all the familiar names. I'm liking this. Duncan Sykes from Rochdale. Reach. It's all out of that in Rochdale, don't they? You know, but Mark, um, what's his name? Uh, um, oh, Radio 1 DJ, Mark, not Mark Radcliffe, um, ex Radio 1 DJ from years ago. Come on, um, it's going to take 30 seconds. Uh, Duncan, tell me, who's your most famous son? His sister is a DJ on Six Music at the moment. Um, can't remember, used to be a presenter on uh, uh the old Grey Whistle Test for a very brief while. In fact, he was a presenter on the old Grey Whistle Test with Mark Allen. And um, the other fella, who used to be the editor of Smash Hits, when the alarm were on in, I think, 1985. What's his name? What's his name? Um, Andy Kershaw. Thank you, James Ramsden. 30-second delay. 
you were fast on the buttons there, Andy Kershaw, who I've done a reasonable impression of on my uh, podcast, Gareth Jones on Speed. I was in Rari the other week, listening to Corto Ungalele, who's playing a tune entirely made up of an, in- an instrument, entirely made up of parts from a 1974 Peugeot 404. Yeah, terrible impression. Sorry. Uh, Stu R. Is that Stuart Rutter? Is that Stuart Rutter? I think it might be. Uh, Umatico, Michael coming. Michael, good evening. A big scimitar hello from Windermere. Are you in Are you in Windermere in Northamptonshire? Oh, that version of Windermere in Northamptonshire. Um, Michael, got a r- super treat for you at the end of the programme today. Super treat. John Selwyn Edwards. Red Eye in from California. Hello, Red. Hello, Juju. Hello, Megan. I've forgotten your son's name. Jacob, my brain stalled for a moment. Brain fart. I know it's Jacob. My brain didn't for a moment. Shame on me. Hello, California. Will you ever forgive me for that? Um, uh, waves to, uh, nice to see you guys waving to Ohio. Uh, um, who else have we got in here? John Jones. Can't change chat name to John Bryn. Ah, oh, that's my brother. Everyone wave to my brother. John Bryn. John Bryn Jones. Uh, and it is Stuart Rutter, Stuart R, and Carol Summers. Oh, Carol, you feature large in this episode tonight. You will see how in a moment. And Tony Salinger. Oh, Tony Salinger. Hello, my name is Tony. I do the of Tony Salinger. Hello, Tony. Tony Salinger, pal of mine for 39 years, maybe? Something like that. Um, Tony, I first met Tony. He's a sound guy and a tour manager for The Alarm. And has been a great ally. I am uh, the godfather to his son. Hello, lawyer. And uh, lawyer's not his son's name. That's his other half's name. I don't know if lawyer's watching in America. But And Tony did the sound for um, the Gareth Jones on speed uh, 10 years on speed live events a few years ago did an amazing job and they to see Tony on here hello Tony uh, uh, and Brian Thomas uh, greetings brother Jones greetings brother Thomas right that's a hellos have I missed anyone out have I missed Daz Munro Daz hello Daz stamp your hands and clap your feet all right that's uh, that's what we say as Slade fans Daz Munro we may be inching closer to getting our band together because we're approaching a little chink in lockdown. Uh, Can't say chink, can we? Sorry, no, a little gap in lockdown. We will merge into the daylight together. And uh, uh, yeah, Daz, we'll get to play some songs together. I had a couple of ideas for songs that we could do again today. Right, talking of songs, lubrication for the song. Penderin. Tonight, again, after the gin we had last week, I'm returning to Welsh whiskey. And I got some amazing news today. Absolutely amazing news from um, my friend Steve Allen Jones, who posted it on Twitter, on uh, Facebook, who observed that Penderin, who are based in Aberdeer in South Wales, my favourite whiskey, are setting up a distillery in North Wales, in Llandidna not far from where I'm from, where I go and visit a great deal. And there's going to be a a Penderian visitor centre and a distillery there. You may find a slightly inebriated Welshman outside who looks and sounds like me. I'll be there. I'm so happy. I hope they do a special North Walian version, a localised version of their whiskey. That'd be great. So, everybody, cheers. Please raise your glasses. I'm sure you've got um, an assortment of drinks there. Take a sip. Oh dear, I seem to have finished my whiskey. <clears throat> Which means it's probably time for a song. Crash bang. I just knocked my guitar stand over. Where's me roadie? Where are you, Eddie McDonald? If I'm your roadie, you're my roadie. Right. Oh. Oh, are we in tune? Hang on, hang on. Just checking, tune in. Yeah. Oh. 
Bear with me while I tune up. You don't get this at other gigs. Close enough for folk music. Close enough for rock and roll, as my friend Tony Sellinger said. Have a bang on that little number. Right then, uh, we're going to start with a song by an artist who I adore. I only do songs by artists I really love, have you noticed? And here's a song which, um, when the artist in question does this song, I think it's, it will sound very different to my version. Uh, <laughs> it'll probably sound good. <laughs> Just queued up the lyrics. Uh, he's got an extraordinary voice, uh, a different sort of voice to my voice. But I'm going to sing this song gently and uh, see if it works. The song... <coughs> the song is called... Um, hang on, I'm bashing things. I've got enough, I haven't got enough room here today. Um, the song is called Innocent When You Dream. The bats are in the belfry The dew is on the moor Where are the arms that held me? Hang on, I've got my headphones on. Let's start that again, shall we? The bats are in the belfry The dew is on the moor where are the arms that held me and pledged her love before? And pledged her love before. I don't know if you know this song. Sing along if you can. It's such a sad old feeling. The fields are soft and green. It's memories that I'm stealing But you're innocent when you dream When you dream You're innocent when you dream When you dream You're innocent when you dream I made a golden promise that we would never part I gave my love a locket And then I broke her heart And then I broke her heart Wait for it, wait for it, there's more, there's more Just gotta scroll down It's such a sad old feeling The fields are soft and green It's memories that I'm stealing But you're innocent when you dream When you dream You're innocent when you dream When you dream you're innocent when you dream Running through the graveyard As we laughed, my friends and I We swore we'd be together Until the day we die until the day we die Everyone It's such a sad old feeling <laughs> Hang on It's such a sad old feeling The fields are soft and green It's memories that I'm stealing but you're innocent when you dream, when you dream. You're innocent when you dream, when you dream. You're innocent when you dream. I love you. 
love that song. It sounds very different. When the man in question sings, it, it sings more like this. Uh, <clears throat> see if I can do this. Running through the graveyard As we laugh, my friends and I We swore we'd be together Until the day we die Until the day we die It's such a sad old feeling Oh, he made the same mistake as me. It's such a sad old feeling. The fields are soft and green. It's memories that I'm stealing. But you're innocent when you dream. When you dream. You're innocent when you dream. When you dream. You're innocent when you dream. Tom Waits. I'm sure you worked that out. You pick up my guitar, so. Tom Waits. I love Tom Waits. Tom Waits is one of those guys who... He's uh, one of the very few guys who, who can disguise a... Truly beautiful song with a terrifying voice. <laughs> Apart from me. <laughs> I can disguise a truly beautiful song with a terrifying voice. <laughs> but I do love the way that Tom Waits does it. Okay. More Penderim. Hang on. Um, yeah. It, 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 it. It's not good, is it? No, it's not good. The end of the pendant. Hopefully there's more. Um, yeah, Tom Waits. Huge fan of Tom Waits. Let's have a look. Let's have a look what you're saying. Uh, thank you very much, Carol Summers. Good choice. We love Tom Waits. Uh, VB adores that song. I'm very pleased. Even my terrible version of it. Thank you for the round of applause, people. Uh, enjoyed that, Babs. Uh, it's... Uh, I, I read that to someone uh, writing in a in a in a West Midlands accent. Enjoyed that, Babs. Oh, it was good, right? Yeah. It's actually my friend Dave Kemp who said enjoyed that. Babs was whistling along. Babs, Barbara Kemp, his wife. Hello, Babs. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Dave. Nice to have you with us tonight. I don't think I've got a Slade song lined up for you tonight. Maybe I should. My friend Dave Kemp runs. Pretty much everything to do with Slade and Slady online, who you've heard me talk about many times. Pete Cole! Hello, Pete Cole! Joined us now. Um, Duncan Sykes, excellent Tom Waits impression. Thank you. No pain in the throat to do that. Penderian allows you to do that. Mm. Mm. And that's right, Michael Cumming. Tom Waits for no man. Googie Withers. Is she? Um... Uh, moonfish trombones, swordfish trombones, not moonfish trombones, uh, Ian Welsh, but close enough for rock and roll. Um, boo, who's saying boo? Oh, boo, D Daly saying boo because of no Slade songs. Hello, D. Another one of the Slade massive. Um, maybe I could find a Slade song for you. We'll see. We'll see. How are we doing for time? It's 20 past nine already. Okay. We've got a bit of a theme to the show uh, today, uh, time travel. Because um, I said I talk about Doctor Who because I've got quite a lot to say about Doctor Who. And we've got a rather unique piece of music to share with you later on, which my dear friend Steve Summers has collaborated with me on, which I am enormously proud. And uh, okay, D, I'm seeing a message. I will, I will slide in a Slade song if I can later on. But let's let's do the um, let's do the Doctor Who thing first. Um, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. There are always clues, you know. You often see if I'm on television, if I'm doing doing how, you see me doing the, the how signal. My hands always like that because I'm a Star Trek fan. Sneak in signals, and you'll see that I occasionally on how of warm Star Trek shirts or Star Trek pins. And when I was doing the Big Bang, uh, I got this scarf to wear when we were out on location because it's not quite as long as 
Tom Baker's scarf and actually doubles up as a brilliant coronavirus mask. I'm sure that's effective at three meters or four meters. But um, yeah, love, love Doctor Who. And um, I'm old enough, as maybe some of you on there might be, to remember... I only just remember the very first Doctor Who, William Hartnell. I think he became Patrick Troughton. Was it 1966 or 1967? You'll be able to look this up because you, you have access to the internet. I'm talking to you guys. I'm not going to look it up. But if it was 66 or 67, I would have been five or six years old. And I, I vaguely have the memory of... Um, uh, William Hartnell becoming Patrick Troughton. So Patrick Troughton was my first proper Doctor Who. I was terrified of the Daleks. Cybermen, not so much. But I loved um, Patrick Troughton. I liked his um, nuttiness, his eccentricity. You know, he played a, a recorder. And two of the people on very early Doctor Who, Fraser Hines, uh, who played Jamie, a 16th century, perhaps later than that a jacobite uh, and he wore a kilt and i think he was probably the first person i saw wearing a kilt um and i thought man that's immeasurably cool and if you've seen me do any live stuff uh you'll know you know live stuff on stage you know i wear a kilt when i'm on stage and it's largely thanks to uh, that jamie character and uh, joe callis from the Rosillos that i wear a kilt so you can't underestimate the influence that Doctor Who has had on me over the years. Um, Patrick Troughton years. Do you remember the Yeti episode? Maybe you're not quite old as me to remember that. But that burned heavily in my memory. And I also re vividly remember when Patrick Troughton regenerated into John Pertwee, the karate Doctor Who. And uh, I'm, he was given a choice. I seem to remember he was, he, and he rejected. Oh no, he's too this, he's too that. And eventually, because he couldn't decide, poof, they, the Time Lords of Gallifrey decided who he was going to regenerate into. And then there was what might be argued as the golden age of Doctor Who. It, it, there is no golden age of Doctor Who because everybody has their own personal golden age of Doctor Who. You know, you're the Doctor that you love most. That's your golden age of Doctor Who. Um, I loved Troughton. I really loved John Pertwee. I adored Elizabeth Sladen. <gasps> oh, she's gone. Poor Elizabeth Sladen. She, her uh, Sarah Jane Adventures was something that my two boys, Tycho and Indy, watched and enjoyed. And I was so happy that she got that wonderful relaunch of her career in the last few years of her life. But I thought she was delicious on um, Doctor Who back in the 70s. And, um, oh, I've forgotten the name, the actor who played, Katie Manning, the actor who played Joe Grant. Uh, oh, Joe Grant was amazing too. But I got a message from Joe Grant. I tweeted a few weeks ago. I was ill for about 12 days and may or may not have been coronavirus until we get the tests. We'll never know. But um, I tweeted that the only way through this was watching hours and hours and hours of the mighty boosh and included the mighty boosh hashtag and katie manning contacted me to say oh yes yes I, that's a very good idea wow wow katie manning and have you ever seen that picture of katie manning a strider dalek outrageous beautiful um so yeah big doctor who fam and then in Ooh, when was it? I think it was about November 1980. I was on tour with Seventeen, the band who became the Alarm, as their roadie. And we had a day off in Leeds. And I was staying in um, uh, the Queen's Hotel in Leeds, a hotel I love. We love that hotel, don't we, V? It's so cool. Bit of faded glory. And I went downstairs, uh, off somewhere, I can't remember where exactly. In fact, I was going to Wakefield to see Slade play in Wakefield, but that's a whole other story. Um, went downstairs, I was crashing 
in a room for, with a chap called Hein Hoven, who was, I won't tell you this, it's, it's unnecessary. But as I went downstairs, there, large as life, in reception, waiting for a taxi, was Tom Baker, the third doctor. Is that right? Fourth doctor. The fourth doctor, Tom Baker. Big old Tom Baker. With his big eyes. Big lovely eyes. Now, shall I find this picture? I've got a picture. Uh, it's not a picture of me and Tom Baker. But it is a picture of what I looked like pretty much on the day that I met Tom Baker. Um, where is it? Is in the rock and roll years? Because they were the rock and roll years. Just Gareth, let's have a look. Bear with me. You don't mind while I do this. I'm overheating in here now. Uh, okay. Um, if I open this up, we might just... Uh, and I search Gareth's top. That might help me find it. No, must be in the rock and roll years folder. Bear with me. This is it's going to be worth it, believe me. It's going to be worth... Maybe it isn't, but it's worth a shot. Um, rock and roll years. Is it in here? Yes, got it. Booyah. Right, here we go. Uh, here's the picture I'm talking about. It's that one. That is what I looked like in 1980. Oh, where's it gone? Come back. Oh, it won't zoom. That's weird. That's me um, with eyeliner on and bleach blonde hair when I was in the gallery. In uh, Now, the gallery was a club in uh, downstairs underneath the Marina Hotel in Rill in 1980. I wish I could remember this lady's name. Can't remember her name. A real light. Um, but that's what I looked like. I had bleach blonde hair. And if I remember, because it was 1980, um, I was wearing one of those shirts with a diagonal zip across it. Very Gary Newman, very alien. And I introduced myself to Tom Baker. I went over to him and said, Oh, uh, Mr. Baker, I'm Valerian from Altair 6. I remember the very words. That's what I said to him. Renardi boy, you're a long way from home, he said with glee. And he was brilliant. We talked for about 45 minutes. We chatted about Doctor Who and why uh, he was leaving it. He told me that he really enjoyed Doctor Who and he was only leaving because he wanted to see someone else as Doctor Who. And he felt that Doctor Who was the modern version of um, uh, uh, Basil Rathbone, um, Sherlock Holmes. In that it's a well-known character that lots of people can play and... They can make it their own. It's a bit like doing Shakespeare. You can make Othello your own, you know? And he certainly owned Doctor Who. He was fantastic. I can't tell you how lovely he was. And I met another Doctor as well. I met um, uh, Sylvester McCoy. Oh, Sylvester McCoy. I was on a TV show with him. I can't even remember what it was. Some sort of quiz show, game show that we recorded in Guildford. Uh, that Chris Tarrant was also on, and Bill Oddie. This <laughs> sounded like a Alan Partridge story now. Get Bill Oddie on the phone. And I remember talking to Bill Oddie about asking who he would cast as the new goodies. Because actually, I'd love to be in the goodies. If they rebooted the goodies, I would love to be one of the goodies. I don't know which one. I'm overheating here. But, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, so I met Sylvester McCoy, who was very sweet, very, very sweet. And, okay, and here's one for the Slade fans as well. In the Doctor Who Slade crossover Venn diagram, I got to know Sophie Aldred. Do you remember Ace, who was um, Sylvester McCoy's um, uh, companion in Doctor Who? And I loved it because she wore a, uh, a US Navy jacket with NASA patches all over it, which I'd been wearing for years anyway. And I thought, ah, oh, it's my kind of person. And she was great. She was really feisty. And I got to know Sophie Aldred because she worked out on a show called, was it called Telegantic Megavision or Wow? Maybe called Wow. A Saturday morning show made in Maidstone at TVS, a TV studio I worked out a great deal. And it must have been near Christmas because. Uh, 
uh, I ended up playing Merry Christmas, everybody, on this very acoustic guitar, live on Saturday morning television, with Sophie Aldred playing the trumpet. She played the melody on a trumpet. She's a very good trumpet or cornet player. So you go, there are all my connections with Doctor Who. Um, never met Matt Smith. Never met David Tennant. Never met, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? Big Ears. Um, um, Christopher Eccleston, thank you. Um, uh, never met Capaldi. Oh, wasn't Capaldi a fantastic Doctor Who? Or Doctor, we should say. If I had three favourite Doctors, in order, it's really tricky. Matt Smith. I love Matt Smith. Matt Smith had a, an anger to him, a tenderness to him, uh, a sense of lunacy and excitement. In some ways, he evoked um, uh, uh, Troughton for me, you know, with sort of the Dickie Bowen, the Tweedy sort of thing. I loved Capaldi. Capaldi was fantastic. Uh, and Troughton, they're my three favourite doctors. I, of course, love Tom Baker and John Pertwee and all the others, but my three favourites... Matt Smith and Capaldi equal number one. And one of the things that happened in the Capaldi years, I wrote it down for you. There's one scene in Doctor Who which is one of the best bits of writing I think I've ever, 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 ever encountered in almost anything. There's a scene where Clara Oswald loses her lover, her partner, um, Danny Pink. Is that his name? Danny Pink? Yeah. And uh, she wants to go back in time, to get the doctor to go back in time, to fix that problem, to stop him from being killed. And she knows the doctor won't do this because there are some things fixed in time. So she steals all the keys to the TARDIS and disposes of them one by one. And then they go to either the centre of the earth or a volcano or somewhere. And she's got the final key and she says to the doctor, take me back in time to fix this. And he says, no, I'm not doing it. She throws the key away. And that's it. The doctor can't get back in the TARDIS. Well, as luck would have it, the doctor can get back in the TARDIS. Goes back in the TARDIS. And Clara follows him in. And the doctor makes this unbelievable speech. See if I can do it in the style of um, Capaldi or something like it. It goes, you betrayed me. You betrayed my trust. You betrayed our friendship. You betrayed everything I ever stood for. You let me down. <laughs> it's more Billy Connolly than Peter Capaldi, isn't it? You let me down. So you did. That's marvellous. I'm the doctor. I, I play the banjo. Um... Uh, and then he decides to help her, and Clara says, to him, why are you helping me? And this, this next line is one of the best bits of writing. It almost breaks my heart to say this. The Doctor says, why do you think I care so little, sorry, do you think that I care for you so little that betraying me would make a difference? Now, if ever there is an example of true love, that's it, isn't it? That one sentence. And who'd think that you get something as powerful as that in a kid's, okay, a family entertainment science fiction show. But that's the beauty of Doctor Who. It, it grows and ebbs and flows and it's built on the greatest premise you can imagine. Someone, I wouldn't say a man, someone with a, a machine that could take you anywhere in time and space in space and time do it that way around which means you have infinite possibilities in stories if ever there's a series that could run for 50 years that's how you write it down man of the box can go anywhere do anything well that's going to run for more than three episodes isn't it genius absolute genius doctor who's in a little bit of trouble at the moment it's not in the the best of places, I think, at the moment. And it's not Jodie Whittaker's fault. Jodie Whittaker is glorious. Have you seen um, uh, 
Attack the Hood. Have you seen that film? Jodie Whittaker is in that. Attack the Block. Attack the block. Thank you. Not Attack the Hood. Thank you, V. Attack the Block. She is astounding in that. And when she got cast as a doctor, I thought, brilliant. No qualms that it's a, a woman. No. That's a fantastic idea. Because, as we know, um, Time Lords have been regenerated in either gender or sex, depending what you, you know, how you, you term that. Uh, however, the trouble that Doctor Who is in at the moment is down to the fact that it's a clean sweep, that they did away with pretty much all the continuity that came before. I'm talking about production continuity. Um, because when you had a transition from... Uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, I've got his name. D Davis, the uh, Russell Davis. Oh, hello, Russell Davis. I'm glad I have a Oh, I love Doctor Who. So, I love him. He's brilliant. And Doctor Who historically is kind of Welsh too, because you know that the the Daleks are Welsh. Did you know that the Daleks are Welsh? John Nathan Turner was that his name? He was a Welshman. He invented the Daleks. So the Daleks should have a Welsh accent and probably be from. I don't know, Gwyneth, exterminate, let's go look at that. That would be hilarious, wouldn't it? Um, they should have a Welsh Dalek. If I was in charge of Doctor Who, my sister Caris thought I should be Doctor Who, the Doctor, sorry, a few years ago. I would love to have been the Doctor, but I don't know if I'm a good enough actor, but I would love to have been the Doctor. But um, Doctor Who's in a bit of a mess at the moment because the writing on the series just isn't as good as it has been in the past. Moffat... His years on Doctor Who were phenomenal. There were some very clever stories, and he commissioned great writers to write great stories. It was really, 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 really strong Doctor Who during the Moffat years. It got a bit complex for kids. There were some story arcs which were a bit... Wait, what, 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 what now? But when you consider stuff like um, uh, The Weeping Angels, one of the greatest inventions ever in Doctor Who absolutely takes the essence of Doctor Who, which is to identify something in your life that might be a bit scary and make it truly terrifying. That's, that's what Doctor Who is all about. Do you remember um, the, the idea of the crack in the wall at the start of the uh, Matt Smith period? Cracks in the wall are kind of scary. The monsters under the bed, the darkness, and I don't mean the band from Suffolk. You know, um, they were a bit scary, though. You know, the Moffat years were phenomenal. The Russell T. Davis years were amazing, the way that they asked the question, what would life be like with the Doctor? If you did travel with the Doctor, what would that do to your life on Earth? And we're sort of touching again on that now in the Jodie Whittaker Doctor years. But I struggle with the new Doctor because the, um, the, the, the Scooby gang, as I call them, the... Uh, the friends of the Doctor, the companions, there's too many of them. I need, so they don't get enough airtime for us to care about them. The Doctor's at his best when he's got one or two companions. That whole story arc of the relationship between you know, Matt Smith and Amy Pond and um, Rory, who I knew a long time ago when he was a children's ITV presenter, uh, and then the uh, relationship between um, uh, Matt Smith and... Um, Clara Oswald, which mutated into the relationship with uh, Capaldi, and she didn't know him. Who is this guy? Am I? And he didn't know himself. Am I a good man? Brilliant, fundamental questions. Right. So where's all this leading? Um, well, I'm hoping that the BBC will realise that they have something very precious in Doctor Who, and they need to correct the funny avenue that it's gone down at the moment. There have been some good episodes in Doctor Who recently, in the Jodie Whittaker two seasons. But the last episode of that last season where they resolved this whole timeless child thing where it turns out the Doctor isn't a Time Lord but is from another race. Spoilers! Oh, sorry, spoilers, Violet says. Am I really? <laughs> sorry, if you haven't seen it, I won't mention it. That, that That's wrong, but I don't know. Um, but the one thing that I think um, Chris Chibnall does do well is names. He's come up with some good names in the past. The only one I can think of at the moment is Tech Tayoon, which is a very alien sounding name that he came up with for a character in Doctor Who at the moment. Tech Tayoon, it's a great name. 
and oh was it tim small what's the name of the uh the monster with the the teeth that he keeps in his face that name is very funny that's a funny that's a good idea the rest of it sorry but i'm going to continue watching because i want it to be good right where's this all leading it's leading to um a piece of music let me uh, cue it up for you um as you know um I love Doctor Who. I think I may have made that quite clear. And I'm quite fond of folk music. But you wouldn't think that there is a crossover between folk music and Doctor Who. Maybe there wasn't. Until now. Because here I present, with the aid of my great friend Steve Summers, um, a version of the Doctor Who theme as a piece of folk music. So I'm going to mute my microphone and cue up the tunes. You ready for this? You'll enjoy. Doctor Who versus the maid with the nut brown hair. Me and my great pal, Steve Summers, reinventing, yes, you're absolutely right, um, uh, Mark Sepek, Delia Derbyshire's remarkable inventiveness to create that tune using instruments that they built themselves at the BBC Radiophonic workshop is there anything further from folk music than electronic music well as you know from my previous episodes when i've done gary newman songs as folk songs i believe gary newman is folk music and so that crossover between electronic and folk music exists in my head i hope you enjoyed that uh, i um i would love to hear that as the opening to doctor who wouldn't it be great if they had one doctor who which was sort of set in i don't know 16th century 
Portsmouth or something, and it started with a folk version, with the accordion and everything. I can't thank Steve Summers enough for playing um, Ulian pipes, Irish pipes, and uh, whistle, a high whistle and a low whistle on that, and all the other bits I played right here on my computer and jumped around the living room, recorded the rest of the video for that in the space of about an hour and a half, then took me about three days to <laughs> edit it. Oh, why do I do these things? Because I love you, that's why. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve Summers, he's on here. Steve Summers, are you there, Steve? Is he, is he there, V? Is Steve with us tonight? He should be. I know Carol, his wife, is. Um, can we have an applause for Dr. Steve Summers, Doctor of Medicine and Doctor of Who Music? Enough respect. And here's the thing, here's the thing. Um... Let me show you a thing. Uh, well, I talked about um, this lady earlier on. Where is the screen to? This lady, um, Jenna Coleman, who played Clara Oswald in Doctor Who, who is a, a great actor, fab actor, but immeasurably pretty. And in some ways, she made uh, Doctor Who fantastic for me and also impossible to watch. Um, she was so pretty. I loved her eyes so much that in the um, in the episodes that she was on, in the first sort of few episodes, I had no idea what was going on. I completely couldn't follow the uh, the story arc because all I was thinking was, oh, she's got lovely eyes. She's so pretty. And it took me a long time to get over that. Uh, yeah, really. She, uh, I, great actor. And... Uh, I was, when was this? About two years ago? Went out to the post office here in Stoke Newington, where we live in North London. Um, went out to the post office, and as I walked past the post office door, a, a woman came out, I looked at her and went, it was Jenna Coleman. Actual Jenna, actual Jenna Coleman. Now, I've been on telly for 800 years. I'm quite used to meeting all these people who are very famous, and that's fine. But I met Jenna Coleman in the, in, in the hood here, and I was genuinely starstruck. I couldn't speak to her. I just looked at her and went, hey, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, I love you, but I didn't. That's all my head was saying. I couldn't actually speak. And it turns out that she lives here, up by the, um, the reservoirs, not far away. Not that I've been parked outside of her house stalking her. Or anything but here's a bizarre link here's a bizarre thing right um, let me show you something one, one of the reasons that I find uh, Jenna Coleman mesmerizing is that she is the living image of my very first girlfriend this lady look here we are in 1978 you can tell it's 1978 because um, I'm wearing a choker and so is Carol um, uh, which is what um, uh, Hugh Cornwall from the Stranglers used to wear. So this is in my sort of Stranglers period. I've just had my hair cut short. Look at that. That's actual Jenna Coleman, isn't it? I, I, I seriously can't separate the two. Uh, it's Carol, who was my first girlfriend and still one of my greatest friends. And as it would turn out, is the wife of Steve Summers, the man who played all the tricky instruments on that piece of folk music, the Doctor Who theme. So it all comes together, you see, in the giant Venn diagram. Um, it, yeah, one last picture of, of Jenna Coleman, because uh, look at this. She dresses like Carol. This is pretty much how Carol dresses, as if, you know, she doesn't look enough like Carol. She dresses like her as well, just to make things complicated. And we're still great pals here's a picture of us more recently uh, mimic oh wrong picture hang on hang on hang on where are we there there it is of me and carol uh that it was actually unbelievably 18 years ago and we're still great friends still great gr the greatest of friends so carol and steve who i know are here watching this at the moment thank you guys steve thank you very 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 much for playing on that because my version wouldn't have been anything without your flautism and pipism i think i may have invented some new words there right let's have a look at what you're saying dr Hugh, dr who irish stew 
Yes, that's probably what it was. Um, you may notice that the melody that sort of broke out of the Doctor Who theme was called uh, The Girl with the Nut Brown Hair, which um, uh, is an old Irish folk song which uh, Van Morrison and the Chieftains did on an ar album called Irish Heartbeats, one of my favourite albums. Etc. Right, let's have a look. Anne Ashmore said that was fantastic. R Ron Grainer wrote it, correct. Thank you, Gareth Sullis. Ron Grainer wrote the tune, Delia Derbyshire produced it. Um, uh, that's absolutely true. <laughs> and this is great, great factoid, uh, Gareth Sullis. Dealey Derbyshire put it together and Ron said, did I write that? <laughs> One of the most innovative pieces of music ever. Um, and I'm glad, Hyper Kerry, that you agree that Clara and Carol, or Jenna and Carol, look alike, because it's not just me. Um, my brother John Brid observed that the banjo made it sound a bit like the Hitchhiker's Guide. Down, 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 down. And of course, there's a Doctor Who Hitchhiker's Guide crossover as we know. Uh, I met um, Douglas Adams very briefly once at a Bob Dylan gig in Finsbury Park in Stoke Newington, uh, in, in Finsbury Park, just up the road once. Um, uh, uh, what else have we got? Mm, things to mention here. Uh, I can hear you, Clem Fandango, says Bob Hercrat. Clem Fandango who uh, worked with Michael Cumming, who is on here, Michael. Um, Michael directed Toast of London, television. And uh, so he knows the actor who played Clem Fandango, who's now in Star Trek, was in Star Trek Discovery. Oh, which brings me back to Star Trek. That wonderful bit of news. Gosh, you've only got 10 minutes left. That wonderful bit of news that there's a new Star Trek series called um, Strange New Worlds coming soon. Uh, it's the adventures of the USS Enterprise in the years preceding Kirk becoming the captain. When Christopher Pike was the captain, played by Anson Mount, who is fantastic. He did a great job of being Pike. And I think Ethan Peck, who plays Spock, um, Gregory Peck's grandson, yeah, grandson or grandnephew, grandson, I think, did a great job as Spock. Okay. We've got 10 minutes, which means I promised a dip into... Yes, that's right, uh, Tony Taylor. The, the, the theme to The Hitchhiker's Guide was by the Eagles. Down, da -da -down, down, 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 da -da -down. Can't remember what it's called. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, because I'm going to stick to an hour, roughly, this year, this, this time round, because last week it was an hour and a half. But um, I've got a, a bit of video to show you, uh, a, a bit more of a time travel story, really. And um, now this is gonna need some explanation. Back in 1976, I was 15 years old, and Britain was in the throes of an energy crisis. There were power cuts, do you remember? We had power cuts, they were limiting uh, the amount of electricity to houses. We had like two hours a day without power. And um, there was a plan to try and, it was a real crisis. There was a plan to try and um, make the school day different to work through this crisis. And the plan was that we were all going to school at 6.30 in the morning, come home at midday. This was save energy because they wouldn't have to feed us at lunchtime and they wouldn't have to heat us through the lunch break. And obviously, Teachers and pupils, of course, were up in arms about this. What? Going to get to school for 6.30 in the morning? Really? That's insane. I'm not going to do that. And so my physics teacher, Gomer Davis, a wonderful Welshman, because we studied physics through the medium of the Welsh language in my high school, Glen Cluid, he decided that we should make a protest film about it to show at the school fair. So my great friends, David Bradbury and Pete Picton, were enlisted as the crew. I was enlisted as the actor. And Mark Jones, a great pal of ours, was enlisted as the pianist to provide a soundtrack. And we made a silent film about a time machine. Now, it's in Welsh, but I will do a Sim Tran 
for you. It's called a device, which means the device. Now let's hope I can get the levels right so you can, you can hear what I'm saying against the music. In fact, I'm gonna turn the music down a little bit so I know that this is safe. Here we go. A device, which is Welsh for the device. Here I am sitting in a laboratory reading a Cymro, the Welsh newspaper, and I read about this plan to change the length of the school day. Dyr nod ysgol i fod yn hirach i arbed pinoedd. School day to be longer to save money. So what is the solution for this with my 1976 lapels? Well, off I go into my laboratory using science to cure this issue. Using a clock and some electronic devices and a second clock, I come up with a device. A device called the Vice Kavlami Minidai, a device for accelerating minutes. It's a time acceleration machine. Swithva is the Welsh word for office. This is the teacher's office, the school office, where the length of the school day is controlled. There's a clock in there that organizes the, the lessons length. So in he goes, and I install the device into the clock that measures the school day length. And at first, no real change until I turn it on. And then it's as if things start speeding up. You seem to be able to cut through wood in half the time it would normally take. Flames burn twice as quickly. Hammering takes half the time. Mathematical formulae can be solved in half the time. Even clearing up after lessons happens in double quick time. And the Welsh learned to play football at double speed, which is why they became such a force in football many years later. And suddenly the entire school day is compressed into moments and it's 20 past three and time to go home in our 1970s buses. Teachers are absolutely befuddled. How come it's 20 past three already? But there's a side effect of this time acceleration machine. Even though the designer realizes that it's successful by reading about it in the papers, accelerating time accidentally accelerates him out of existence. Acting, Gareth B. Jones, playing the piano, David Bradbury, Andy Peters, and Peter Picton, my great mates. Gomer Davis, 1976. That is something from my deep, 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 dark archive. That's, in fact, the first bit of dramatic acting on the media I ever did. I did some sort of school theatre stuff and youth theatre stuff, but it was the first time I was ever filmed by my physics teacher, which is kind of appropriate because, um, you know, the bulk of what I've done on television over the years after Get Fresh, if you think of How To and The Big Bang and Tomorrow's World, was science television. So there you go. That, that one moment was pivotal in my whole life. Gomer Davis my physics teacher, and Carol's physics teacher too, who's on here, she'll remember him, a remarkable man. Okay, we're getting close, three minutes away. I'm gonna do a couple of messages before I do the final song. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, Mark Sepek saying that he can't wait for the new Star Trek series. Yeah, me too. Um, we may have to wait, because I don't know how they're gonna shoot it during lockdown, how they're gonna manage that. Well, you know, it will come. And they've been very good in the past. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this because, well, as discussed. Um, Steve Summers, fantastic. Now, how about that? A Geordie who writes fantastic in Welsh. I love it when Steve speaks Welsh. Steve, been married to a Welsh girl for, a Welsh girl since, what, mm, July the 6th, 1985? Was that when you got married, Steve? So how many years is that? 35, 45 years? Is that right? 35 years? My maths. <laughs> Hang on. Whatever it is. Um, has, has learnt Welsh. And Steve, man shall I come like ever akin or journey? Well, him. Aye. Man, I'm hossim. Hossim when he glow and doing and shall I come like it akin journey? It's incredible hearing someone speak Welsh with a Geordie accent. Question is, can I speak um, English 
Geordie English with a Welsh accent. Probably not. Yeah, great to see uh, our old teachers, Carol says, on there. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing. I've actually got some pictures of them somewhere, Carol. I will send you to them, but now is not the time of the place. Um, John Red Edwards in America was saying that Keris needs to know about this Welsh Huron nonsense. Thank you very much. Keris Matthews from, um, well, was a member of, uh, what was Keris's band, V? Um, uh, Cal... Uh, It's all over the front page. Catatonia, thank you. Kenneth, uh, who is a mate of John Selwyn Edwards, John Red Edwards, because um, she's a big Bob Dylan fan, and Bob Red works for Bob Dylan. So, yes, tell her about this. She might enjoy it. She might enjoy the folk music from the other week. Um, am I going to finish with Singing in the Rain, asks Stuart Rutter. No. Uh, 1976 was the long hot summer. I think you mean the 73 minor strike. 76 was when we shot that video, and there was uh, there were power cuts then, Tony, if I remember. It was the summer of 76 was impossibly hot, but this was the early winter before then, I think. Um, Catatonia, Bob Urquhart, thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, I promised a Slade song, didn't I? I was going to play a Slade song. Uh, I'm not actually going to finish with the Slade song. You'll have to wait for the Slade song because we're almost out of time. In fact, we're over time because I've got one song that I want to finish with. Um, hang on. Cheers. Because mm. that's just about it apart from our closing song. And um, I hope you like this song. A bit of a bit of a sad song, I think, this one in some ways, but also a beautiful song. And um, uh, it's about... Uh, Wait, I won't tell you what it's about. You'll know the song. But there are three versions of this song that I know. You'll know the most famous one. But it's also been done by uh, the fun-loving criminals. And it's also been covered by the pretenders. <clears throat> and I can't sing like Huey. Very naughty holder, that. That's one for the Slade fans. Burping before singing a song. That's a very naughty holder. Um, I can't sing it like uh, Huey from Fun Loving Criminals. And I can't sing it like um, Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders. Uh, oh, really? But I'll sing it like me. Sorry about that. Let's see. None. <laughs> Get the right key. None love. Don't forget it. It's just a silly phase I'm going through. Just because I call you up. Don't get me wrong. Don't think you got it made. Not love. It's because like to see you but then again it doesn't mean that mean that much to me so if I call you to make a fuss Tell your friends about the two of us. Not love. It's because it's the bit, bit. It's the bit where you sing, "Big boys don't cry."
Thank you. Sorry if I slaughtered that song. It's a beautiful song, sung badly, but I'm hoping you're able to sing along at home and enjoy that. Uh, a couple of last messages. D Daily, Jimmy Lee, Red Leather Jeans, recorded in Strawberry Studio, Stockport. Yes, and um, I actually recorded in Strawberry Studios in Stockport with the Grids from Hollywell, Hollywell's only punk band. But that is a whole other story steve summers 10 cc wore out the tape with all the overdubs absolutely true that story i adore that song thank you very much indeed thank you for putting it with me and my terrible singing well if we're still here under lockdown next week which we will be i'll be here too i hope you are as well please spread the word tell your friends share it on facebook share this on um Twitter, Instagram, uh, when you get the link to next week's show, let everyone know. It's lovely that our audience is growing and I'm genuinely grateful that we get to spend our Friday nights together. This has been Gareth Jones live. I have been actual Gareth Jones live. And oh dear, run out of whiskey. See ya. One last thing, people over on Facebook, I'm sorry I never got a chance to look at your messages today. I'm really, 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 really sorry. I will go through them and uh, respond to them after this show. See you guys. <laughs>